Hi, I'm Dr. Jean Fourry. In this lecture, I want to speak about intellectual disability, which is a chronic lifelong condition that affects some people in the population. Intellectual disability was previously referred to as mental retardation. We no longer use this term and we speak of intellectual disability. This is a combination of deficits that are all related to difficulties with cognitive functioning, which have an impact on the person's adaptive and social behavior. The severity of this disability is determined by a discrepancy between the individual's capabilities in learning and our expectations of what the person should be able to do in the social environment. So the discrepancy between what society expects a person to do and what the person is exhibiting and showing us they can do will give us an indication of the intellectual disability, the deficits in cognitive functioning. The American Association of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities has a definition, and the definition says that the person with an intellectual disability is characterized by significant limitations, both in intellectual functioning and adaptive behaviors. The adaptive behaviors cover many everyday social and practical skills, and also that this disability originates before the age of 18. Intellectual disability is a chronic lifelong condition with persistent mental functioning difficulties throughout the person's life. These difficulties are manifest by limited communication and social skills, and the person learns at a significantly slower pace than their peers. The person with an intellectual disability will require sheltered employment and guardianship for long-term care. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders is used by psychologists for diagnosing an intellectual disability. There are three criteria that must be met in order to make this diagnosis, which is only able to be made by a person registered as a health professional practitioner. This diagnosis cannot be made by teachers or parents the person must be referred for a formal diagnosis. There are three criteria that must be met to make this diagnosis. There must be deficits shown in the intellectual functioning of the person. And these deficits must be shown in their everyday adaptive functioning difficulties. And the age of onset for the intellectual disability is during the childhood phase. A severe intellectual disability is often identified before the age of two years old, whereas a mild disability will sometimes only be identified once the child is at school. An intellectual disability affects all the domains of functioning. But the key ones relate to conceptual difficulties. These deficits are shown in difficulties with language, learning language, literacy, learning to read, using money and time and number concepts, and being self-directed, being able to initiate things and to be able to plan one's life and do things. The social skills deficits are shown by difficulties with interpersonal relationships. Social responsibility taking is limited and often the person's self-esteem will be um, affected. 
People with intellectual disability are often gullible and naive about how the world works, and they have difficulties with problem solving of social aspects. The ability to follow rules and obey laws and avoid victimization is often characterized by these people. There are problems with practical um, everyday skills, difficulties with personal care, with hygiene, with occupational skills of running a house and cooking, um, difficulties with health care, taking care of their own um, health needs, difficulties with transport and travel and using public, um, public transport. You can imagine the difficulties if you have problems with time and money and number and language and reading, that you will have difficulties with all the things that relate to um, our everyday use of schedules and diaries and um, public transport and money and telephones. So the conceptual difficulties manifest in all areas of functioning. So the impact of having a cognitive deficit, a difficulty with brain functioning, has consequences for all, all areas of a person's life. The moral domain knowing right and wrong and being able to obey rules and laws. One's emotional life, the ability to maintain an emotion and regulate one's emotions. These people often will have difficulties with depression and anxiety and will need some medication and assistance with that. So one's self-concept is um, declines. Physical difficulties are often, often seen with these people um, not taking part in sport and being active. So the physical body um, suffers. Socialization is impacted. Difficulties with relationships and friendships and maintaining um, social contact. Personality difficulties. And all of this leads to difficulties with having an independent life. And this is what, as educators, we assist people with developing as much independence and social, um, social functioning as possible. An intellectual disability is the most common of the developmental disabilities. It is estimated that the prevalence of intellectual disabilities affects about 1% of the overall general population. If we look at severe intellectual disabilities, the estimate is about six people per thousand. So six per thousand children or people will have a severe intellectual disability. An intellectual disability is diagnosed by a professional psychologist using uh, intelligence tests. These are special tests that have been designed for a particular population of children, and they are normed according to that population's level of functioning. So an intelligence test is basically giving us a ratio, and the ratio has got to do with the mental age and the child's chronological age. The mental age is, is determined from the items in the intelligence test. These might be building puzzles, doing problem solving, uh, narrating a story, looking at various different functions, executive, language, number, functions of a person's cognitive functioning. And then the mental age, which is determined from this um, IQ test, is compared to the child's chronological age. 
and an intelligence quotient, an IQ test stands for intelligence quotient, which is uh, the mental age divided by the physical age of the child is calculated. So if a child's physical age is, for instance, eight years old, and they do the IQ test, they can do the items, um, the building of puzzles and blocks and numbers, and they are of the IQ test and their mental age comes out at eight years old, then eight divided by eight is one times by 100 is one is 100. So the IQ of the child is 100. So if one's mental age is the same as one's chronological age, the IQ is always 100. If the child cannot do the puzzles and items in the intelligence test, but they can do the items up to the level of a seven-year-old, let's say. They can't do the ones for eight-year-old, no matter how much they try. Then we have a mental age of seven divided by a chronological age of eight, which is approximately 0.87 uh, times that by 100 gives us a, um, an, an 87. So there are ways that the statisticians have worked out um, to norm these IQ tests and to do the stats, but approximately um, the majority of children will sit within the range of a 90 to 110. And so your um, intelligence quotient, the IQ test gives us a ratio of mental age uh, against the physical age of the child. So it tells us if the child is, is unable or cognitively disabled, and that will give us a good indication of a child with an intellectual disability. So the results of IQ tests are often shown on a frequency or bell curve distribution. The lower axis of this um, distribution table shows us the IQs, the intelligence quotient scores. And if we place the IQ of 100 in the center, we then work out, or statisticians work out the, the frequency, the number of people that have this IQ in this range, and the range from 90 to 110 is the average range, and 50%, approximately 50% of the population will fall within that range. So that means that the mental uh, ability of the person equals their chronological age. So the child who's eight years old can do the items of the average eight-year-old. If it falls above um, this level of the 110, we're talking about high average. So this is a child who is chronologically eight years old, but is doing the items of a child who is nine years old and 10 years old and, and going um, older. If we go to the other side of the scale, um, the child is low average if they fall between the 80 and 90 um, ratio of the IQ score. And so here we're talking about children who are doing who are unable to do the items in there for their age, and they're maybe only able to do the items that our, um, a six-year-old can do. And as we go further down there, they can do the items of a five-year-old and a four-year-old and a three-year-old. So the child's chronological age and mental age do not match. For intellectual disability, we are talking about people, children, 
whose IQ falls below the 70% range. And within this red area, uh, we have mild, moderate, severe, and profound. So the mild intellectual disability is generally a 55 to a 69, and then moderate um, in the 40s to 50, 55 range, and severe lower than that, and profound below a 25. The IQ tests, individual IQ tests, become more difficult to administer and less accurate as the, um, the profoundness or the severity of the child's uh, intellectual disability goes further down the scale. It just becomes more difficult to determine what the child can do. Their language is so much worse. Their problem solving is worse, the, their ability to do numbers and the, the puzzles and items on the test are, are, are is much more um, difficult for the child to do. So we are talking about intellectual disability that relates to people who are sitting in the low range of their um, intelligence quotient. So an intellectual disability can be uh, classified into mild, moderate, severe, and profound disabilities. So a child who has a, a mild intellectual disability will be functioning about three to five years below their own lay age, so they mental abilities are three to five years below their chronological age. A child with a moderate difficulty will be about five to seven years below their age. And a child with a severe and profound disability will be functioning about seven years, a mental age of about seven years below their chronological age. So severe and profound intellectual disability is really very, um, very severe and debilitating. The prevalence of mildly disabled children is about 10 in 1,000, for moderate about 3 in 1,000, and for severe and, and profound about 1 in 1,000. For a mild disability, the identification usually happens in formal schooling, although it can happen earlier if um, caregivers and teachers are aware. Uh, for a moderate disability, it's usually determined in preschool. And for severe and profound disabilities, one will be able to identify this during babyhood uh, from the ages of birth to two where the child is not meeting developmental milestones of um, being able to sit and crawl and walk and speak language and first words and um, toilet training and all those milestones will be delayed. We can expect children in the mild range to be attending school. They will be able to cope with an adapted curriculum and with supportive interventions from teachers and the, um, the therapists. With a moderate disability, the child can also be in a special school with um, curricula, um, major curricular adaptations where they learn self-care, social skills, and vocational skills in order to um, uh, become a little bit independent. With a child with a severe, profound disability, often they need to have institutionalized care and um, constant um, supervision and assistance with self-care. These people will be generally dependent on uh, care and support for their, for their, for their lives. The children with mild, um, intellectual disability can become 
independent uh, and can have some semi-skilled vocations where they can earn some earn a living and children with moderate could be uh, in, in supervised or sheltered um, sheltered workshops where they are, are able to to do some some daily activities. The causes of intellectual disabilities are many and there are many, many factors that can have an influence on this disability. If we divide them into prenatal causes, things that happen during uh, fetal development, uh, perinatal causes, things that happen, uh, problems during um, the birthing process, and postnatal causes, difficulties, things that happen after the child um, is born. Prenatal causes are often difficulties with chromosomal, genetic, um, mutational difficulties, and there's a variety of these, such as Down syndrome, uh, Cri du Chat, Kleinefelters, Fragile X, um, Turner, Prada Willi syndrome, and so on. So all of these chromosomal disorders will be um, inherent in the in the child. And there are also difficulties with errors of uh, metabolism, and these can have difficult can have influence on how the brain um, metabolizes and functions. The child can also be born with brain um, malformations such as microcephalus, a small brain, and hydrocephalus, where there is um, uh, additional fluid on the brain that causes pressure that damages the brain. And then there can be various environmental um, impacts of things that the mother has um, been exposed to that, that influence the child at during um, fetal development. Um, so these causes, um, I'll do a little bit more detail of the causes in the next slide. Some of the most um, problematic environmental influences that will um, affect the fetal development while the mom is pregnant relate to malnutrition of the mother. So if the mother's not well nourished, the baby will um, be um, not, fun not developing properly. Various different infections um, that the mother might get might have an impact on fetal development. Uh, lead exposure, very harmful drugs, exposure to radiation, German measles, and so on can all impact the development of the fetus and have consequences for brain development. One of the most harmful um, substances to the developing fetus is alcohol. So if the mother is uh, drinking excessive alcohol during her pregnancy, particularly in the first trimester, the alcohol has serious uh, results on fetal development. These are irreversible and lifelong. It causes neurological damage, and this neurological damage will, um, will be damaging the fetus. And so fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is very common uh, a cause of mental retardation or intellectual disability. And it is 100% preventable. The mother must just not drink any alcohol during pregnancy. This is a a picture showing a six-week-old baby brain. The brain on the left is a normal developing baby's brain at six weeks old, and the brain on the right is a picture of a child with fetal alcohol syndrome, and you can see that the brain is smaller 
and there are serious malformations in the child's brain, which would ultimately result in an intellectual disability should the fetus be born alive. Fetal alcohol spectrum disorder retards the, the fetus's growth and so the, the baby is born with low birth weights, very small babies, uh, small heads and brains, structural abnormalities are often present in the brain and these result in difficulties with um, uh, fine motor skills, difficulties with walking, gross motor skills. There could be problems with eye um, vision, with hearing, hearing loss, eye-hand coordination difficulties, and all these difficulties of the brain damage um, result in poor self-regulation, poor judgment, impulsivity, slow processing speeds, difficulties with doing maths and memory and language. Uh, so all the learning problems associated with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. And then a variety of different other physical defects could occur with brain, uh, with the cardiac problems, with the heart, uh, skeletal problems, the kidney problems, vision and auditory dysfunctions. So a whole variety of different uh, difficulties and that's part of the spectrum. And fetal alcohol spectrum disorder also comes in uh, mild, moderate and severe depending on the difficulties with the, the brain functioning. Postnatal causes of intellectual disability relate to things that happen once the baby is born, and these are environmental and psychosocial problems such as inadequate nutrition, um, adverse living conditions, inadequate health care, and lack of early cognitive stimulation. So lack of um, the language, babies who are not exposed to language and socialization and lots of uh, toys and things to play with can also develop um, some kind of intellectual disability. Other causes of intellectual disability that um, uh, do result in difficulties with uh, brain functioning are severe child abuse, child neglect. Um, there's a lot of research on that. And any traumatic injury to the brain, uh, where the brain is hit or bumped or car accidents, um, infections such as meningitis and encephalitis and lead poisoning, all these things can lead to brain damage and consequently some intellectual disability. There are numerous sources and references that, and websites 
that you can uh, go to for additional in-depth information about intellectual disability. This lecture gave a general overview and some understanding of what an intellectual disability is, the etiology, the prevalence, um, how IQ tests um, are work, and hopefully that has been useful information for teachers, remedial therapists, and learning support educators to assist them with understanding some of the characteristics and how an intellectual disability manifests.